Hello and welcome back to the Project Management Prepcast. I'm your instructor Cornelius Fichtner and this lesson is recorded with a live audience on Facebook and YouTube and we are going to take a look at the project management domains. In particular, this is part one of two in which we want to review the eight performance domains that got introduced with the publication of the PMBOK Guide 7th edition. And right now, in the next hour or so, we want to review the four domains here on the left, stakeholders, team, development approach, and life cycle, as well as planning. One thing I want to make clear before we start going here is this. While we are going to be using the PMBOK guide as a foundation for this, right? I'm not going to be reading the PMBOK guide to you. This is not a reading. This is not a derivative. All of this is based on our own research that we have done and published as an article called Eight Project Performance Domains, the Project Management Experts Guide. Um, yeah, we use the same names. We follow the same performance domains in the same order. Uh, but this article, uh, we've taken the eight domains as a starting point and then gone above and beyond to explain them with input from a group of experts. Here is our agenda. Introduction quickly, what exactly are performance domains? We want to take a look at that. Then we'll review performance domains one to four, about 10 to 15 minutes for each. So a pretty sizable chunk there. And then at the end, a quick take action and a quick takeaways. So let us get started with what are performance domains. So overview here. So with the launch of the Pimbo Guide 7th edition, uh, it brought with it some big changes, in particular a shift away from the process-led uh, approach to becoming more principles-based. And it, it's now much more about the what than the how of successful project management. When I say it, I mean the PIMBOK guide is much more about the what than the how. With this change also comes the incorporation of agile, iterative, hybrid workflows that spawn multiple industries uh, that we project managers work in. And along with the 12 project delivery principles that are in the guide, we now also have the eight project performance domains to further help us guide our behaviors and good practices. You'll find, in fact, some very noticeable similarities between the 12 principles and the eight domains. And these kind of serve to emphasize both their importance and also relevance for successful project management. Uh, let's take a look at the PMBOK guide here briefly, because one thing that many people don't realize is the fact that the PMBOK guide is actually two documents. It is the ANSI standard in part one and the PMBOK guide in part two. So the whole thing we call the PMBOK guide, but the PMBOK guide is really only part two of the PMBOK guide document that we all know so well. Um, the standard for project management is part one. You see this here on the right-hand side. I've taken this image from the PMBOK guide for illustrative purposes there. The white section, that is the standard for project management. That is part one. And then below, you'll see the actual PMBOK guide in this sort of purplish uh, kind of thing uh, that we have there. You also see that at the uh, top in the white, those are the 12 project management principles that we review in a different article and in different lessons. And right now we're focusing on the project performance domains in the bottom. So what exactly are project performance domains? Well, they build on what we previously knew as the knowledge areas. And PMI defines project performance domains as a group of related activities that are critical for effective delivery of project outcomes. In other words, project performance domains, they are essential activities that ensure successful projects. Along the 12 project principles, these eight domains, they're used in plan-driven, agile, hybrid methodologies. And 
overall, everything represents the modern workplace, the way that we do project management these days. Let's switch over to our first expert here. This is Marcus Kopko from projectmanagement.plus, and he says, it is essential to note that all project performance domains must always be considered within the scope of a project. Since there are multiple interdependencies between the domains, none of them can exist in isolation and independently of the others. As a experienced product manager, you know this. You tweak on one end and over here things change unexpectedly and you, oh no, undo, undo, right? So everything is interrelated. If you take project management, you can slice and dice it however you want. PMI decided to slice and dice it using these 12 principles and the eight project performance domains. Take another approach and they'll take exactly the same type of project management and it'll be sliced and diced differently. But in the end, to manage a project, you can't just take one of these slices and manage just that. You have to consider the whole of a project. So it doesn't matter whether you have 12 principles and domains, eight domains, or whether you do it in another way. And let me also talk about the processes. You may remember this graphic here from another lesson here in the PrepCast. I think it is important to repeat it here. A very high level conceptual graphic. Let's first talk about the big blue box there at the top that says principles and domains. The intent is to show that we have overarching principles that talk about the what. And when we work in the processes, we use these principles as guidance. And we also have the overarching performance domains that go a little bit deeper into the how, but still primarily address the what. So at the top, that blue box, that is the what of project management. And then the gray processes at the bottom there, and because to a large extent, they are not discussed in the PMBOK guide, seventh edition. Nowhere in the guide will you find some sort of a step-by-step -step instructions on what do you do first, what do you do second, what do you do third in a project. You have to get that from elsewhere. The PMBOK guide, seventh edition, talks about the principles and the domains at the top, but not about the processes. If you manage a project for your company, you most likely have a defined internal project management methodology that describes these processes. So the gray boxes at the bottom, they define the how of project management. Put both of them together and now you can deliver a seriously successful project. Okay. That's it for our brief introduction and overview. What exactly are these domains that we're going to be talking about? So let's start. Uh, we have four to get through, and we are going to be starting with the stakeholders domain where we manage those who are affected by our project. So the stakeholder domain goes beyond any immediate team members to include in, in the wider stakeholder community. We're covering everyone involved in the project. And that means that the term stakeholder can truly mean different things in each project that you manage. This domain teaches us to focus on engaging and collaborating with these stakeholders for effective decision making. And for me, really, this is the most important domain because without people, there are truly, there cannot be a project, right? Let's see what one of our experts says about this uh, from Elizabeth Herrin here from rebelsguide2pm.com. She says, project managers need to engage with stakeholders across the life of the project to ensure that they know why they are doing the work, what needs to be done, and how they can contribute. So in this particular instance, you can already see that um, with this quote, Elizabeth has taken the approach of defining the stakeholders that she's talking about, about the people who are actually working on the project and helping with developing whatever we are developing 
on the product. She also goes on to say that working with stakeholders is an active state and not something that can be done once and then can be forgotten again. Our next expert is Dr. Ra Raman Atri, and um, here we're talking about expectations. We product managers, we have to deliver to stakeholder expectations. And this means that we have to consider how the project deliverables could impact stakeholders and decide the type of communication style required to work effectively with each. And in addition to setting and managing expectations, we project managers are also expected to speak the language of the stakeholders. And obviously, when I say language here, I, I don't mean French or German. I mean that you have to be able to translate between different groups of stakeholders in the room. I remember a situation where my customer and my designer were talking about, uh, it was a web development engagement, and they were talking about two totally different things, yet both of them thought they were talking about the same thing. I realized that and I jumped in and I helped them find each other. So you as the project manager, you act kind of as a translator between diverse groups who may have a particular jargon that you need to translate for each of them. In, practice to, in practical terms, this kind of means that uh, carrying out stakeholder identification and actually knowing who your stakeholders are is important. They need to be thoroughly identified, taken care of in an iterative way throughout the project. Once is simply not enough. They can also change. In some cases, with key stakeholders uh, and leaving, that can have a massive effect on your project. Um, looking at how stakeholders can contribute to project success is also important. You want to make sure that they know why they are on your project. You want regular meetings, keeping them communication channels open. You need to negotiate with the decision makers in order to navigate the complexity of decisions and meet competing, sometimes even conflicting expectations. And then metrics for stakeholders tend to be difficult to gather. There are ways to do that, like a net promoter score, for example, surveys, informal conversations. We do have ways to measure how people feel about the work being run. So you can change what you were doing to be effective. And then finally, you have to show partnership with your stakeholders to execute the project success. Um, Antje Lehmann from antilemon.com, she translates this as follows, and she says, this domain revolves around taking care of everyone involved in the project. Not only the team and all the people hoping to get results from them, but also often forgotten stakeholders, maybe legal teams or people who are in some way affected by the result of a project very marginally. Right. Uh, there is also one important thing that I would like to point out. Um, the PIMBO guide now talks about engagement, stakeholder engagement, not stakeholder management, because we can manage stakeholder expectations and help them understand what they can, what they can get out of the project, but we cannot manage them as people, really. We can engage them. We can get their engagement for our product, but managing them, like you, you manage, I don't know, machinery, there's simply no way uh, to do that, okay? And also, uh, from Oliver Lehman here at oliverlehman.com, uh, this is something when it comes to taking the exam. Take a close look at what is meant by stakeholders. People may use the word differently. Uh, stakeholders can mean different things to each project. It could be those who simply have an investment in the project, those who are active participants, those who have a claim to the project, or those who interact and exert influence over the project. It's really, it also includes stakeholders that you develop the product for. They all need to be factored in. They have a vested interest. In, and in the end, those who are not 
considered stakeholders. Well, they will feel rejected and they can negatively affect your project. So for the PMP exam, make sure you understand when you read a question, what is actually meant. Now, so far, this has been mostly just me talking and presenting, but this is an interactive presentation. Uh, we have people joining us on Facebook and on YouTube there. Uh, looks like about 25, 30 people at the moment have joined us. Hello. And we're now getting into the audience participation section because from here on forward, I would like you to help me out. I have a sample question here about the stakeholder domain from the exam simulator pmexamsimulator.com and i would like you to tell me what you think the correct answer is uh, here's the question as the project unfolds and each sprint results in a working product increment the project sponsor realizes that more and more stakeholders oppose the project despite this the project achieves its objectives. At the project retrospective, the sponsor asks the project leader how they managed to successfully complete the project in this seemingly hostile environment. The project leader replies that A, the team gold plated the product increments to appease the opposing stakeholders. Is it B, stakeholders who opposed the project did not negatively impact the project outcome? Is it C, Supportive stakeholders actively participated in every detail daily stand-up meeting. And could it be D, the product owner rejected any change changes requested after the first sprint. So what do you think might be the reason why the project was successful, even though we had all these negative stakeholders? A, B, C, or D, please type the letter into the chat on Facebook and YouTube. I'll give you about 20 seconds there. And uh, we'll get back. Okay, I am getting the first answers here. In fact, answer is singular. So far, only Satish uh, went out on a limb and Satish said, well, it is B. Ah, here we go. Samir uh, says B. Hachem says A. All right, I can tell you at this point that the correct answer is in fact B. Krista also gave us B. Yes, B is in, indeed correct. And having a large number of unsupportive stakeholders, as we see in this scenario here, that may indeed result in the project missing its objectives. The fact that the project has been successfully completed, that suggests that the project leader, the team leader, effectively engaged with these stakeholders, keeping them from negatively impacting the project's outcome. Yes, so the scenario refers to stakeholder engagement and effective stakeholder engagement results in productive working relationships with the stakeholders and then agreement with the project goals. Obviously, you know, on, on every project that I manage, I always hope that I have only supporting stakeholders and nobody negative, but that's never the case. There will always be somebody who doesn't really appreciate what you're doing. They feel threatened by your project. But if they don't really have that great of an influence over your project, so even if they're very negative but have little influence, that means your project can still be successful. And engaging with the negative stakeholders is always an important step that we project managers have to take. Okay, we are done with our first of the four domains here, the stakeholder domain, and we are moving on to the team where we are leading towards success. Oh, do you notice something on this slide? I'm only noticing this now. Look at the stakeholder domain. I wrote managing those who are affected. Oh my God, it should have been engaging those who are affected. Oh my. Ah, uh, yeah, we'll fix that <laughs> in the future going forward. So please 
mentally think that it doesn't say managing there, mentally think that it says engaging those affected. I made a point of that during uh, reviewing the stakeholders there. All right, moving on. The team, the team. The team domain covers everything that's related to the people who are doing the work on the project and their associated team members. A successful team will work together to deliver the objectives and deliverables of the project. And uh, we, as the project managers, we need to be a facilitator. We have to be able to engage people across a dispersed network of collaborative creatively. And, and we must also strive to ensuring a level playing field across remote and in-person team members so that the people who are away from us still feel engaged and don't feel that they are left out in the cold and not included. Now, I said this was going to be a very engaging uh, audience participation type presentation. Yes, so in three slides, I am going to ask you a question. And the question is simply this. What percent of your team members work virtually on your project? If you want to get ahead of the game, just go ahead and type 10%, 20%, 50%, 100% into the chat right now. So by the time we'll get to that slide, we have your percentages already coming in. Okay, so we're still talking about the team. Let's see what our expert have to say. Whatever target your project has to achieve, it always starts with building the team. This is what Herbert Gonder from Gonder Consulting says about this. But he also points out that naming them a team at the very beginning, that's probably going a little bit far because at the start, uh, that's just a group of people having to be thrown together and working together, right? Uh, let me add to this, right? And as the project manager, your job is to ensure that this loose group of people that Herbert refers to actually becomes a team, allowing them to grow as a team, helping them and working with them through the stages of becoming a team. And these stages, they're usually defined by the Tuckman ladder. Here we go. Uh, this here is the Tuckman uh, ladder of the group stages. There are five stages here. Starts at the top, 11 o'clock there, the green one forming. That is what Herbert was referring to. The team meets, learns about the opportunities, challenges, and then agrees on the goals and begins to tackle the tasks. From there, it goes on to storming uh, uh, around the, the right-hand side clock, uh, clockwise. Uh, this is the second stage uh, of team development where the group really starts to sort itself out, uh, gains each other's trust. So we're, we're starting to, to see the first the teaming happening. Then norming is next. Uh, five o'clock there, the orange looking uh, arrow. Uh, with group norms and roles established, the group members here, they focus on achieving common goals and often reaching unexpectedly high level of success. Oh, wait, no, that was, that was performing. What am I talking about? We're talking about norming here. Uh, norming, that's defined as resolving disagreements. I'm jumping ahead here. So yeah, norming, is about resolving disagreements, personality clashes, and they result in greater intimacy. A spirit of cooperation emerges. And only after that happens, after you have the spirit of cooperation, can you have the group norms, roles established, uh, focus on achieving your common goals. And then in 1977, Tuckman and a colleague of his, they realized, you know what? The team isn't done at this point because they need to actually disperse at the end of the project. And they called this a journey. And that's the, the blue arrow that we have there on the left side, uh, nine o'clock roughly. And this is where we complete everything, the task, and we're breaking the team up. In the end, we as project managers are responsible for trust building, empowering our teams. Th these are essential to get results for our projects, helping our team to go through this and build up, uh, build their, their identity as a team, but still respecting the characteristics of each team that you enable them to work together effectively. Um, in addition to this, I have this here. This is a further dimension uh, to the team domain. Uh, 
this is highlighted by uh, Dr. Penny Poulon in her book. Uh, let's see, what is it called again? Virtual Leadership, Practical Strategies for Success with Remote or Hybrid Work and Teams. That is quite a mouthful. She says that the nature of project teams has shifted since the lockdown in particular. Projects often now need to be delivered through fully remote or hybrid teams. What's important is to ensure that teams can work together effectively, whether they are in the same office or not. Well, let's take a look what your situations are here in regards to the teams. What type of teams do you have? Marjorie says 100% of my people are remote. Uh, but then we have Samir. 0% of my teams are remote. Krista has 3%. Barry, again, 100%. Uh, then we have Hachem, uh, 20%. I hope I pronounced that right. I apologize if I don't. And then we have uh, Manohar at 70%. So you can see that remote teams, some people have them. Some people have a little. Some people have nothing but remote teams. Mine, by the way, are 100% as well. In, in all of my projects that I do, we all work from home here on the PrepCast and on our exam simulator products that we produce. Okay, now let's talk about checking the team's pulse here, right? And uh, we're kind of getting into the closing section. We're having a, the question next here. And and um, as part of this, I would like to know what tool and technique that you use to see how your team is doing. Maybe in particular, those or those of you who have 100% people remote, right? How do you check in on your people? What do you do? Do you just, you know, is it a Zoom call? Is it an email? Uh, how do you know whether your team is doing well or your team is not doing so well? Hmm? How, how do you do that, right? And while you do that, uh, let me just briefly say this. Performance measurement for teams can feel quite subjective. I mean, think about it, right? Um, you ask one person how you're doing. Oh, I'm doing great. The team is really working well. And you ask somebody else, it's like, ah, oh, this is the worst team I've ever worked on. Nobody talks to me. I'm having a really hard time. Very, very subjective kind of situation there. Um, so daily stand-up meetings, they help. Uh, team surveys, they can check in how people are feeling, literally sending them a survey, yes. And uh, many agile retrospective tools, they include informal check-in questions so that you can sample the mode, the mood of the team. Right, we have just one person who Responded here, uh, Marjorie. Ah, we've got a couple more coming in, right? Daily stand-up meetings, Marjorie does those. And uh, she, by the way, is one of the 100 percenters here. And then we have Barry. Barry is also 100 percenter. Daily stand-up meetings and agile retrospectives. I think based on that, we pretty much have it covered there. Daily stand-up meetings, agile retrospectives. Those are obviously the tools that people are using to check in on their remote teams. Sample question again here from the PM exam simulator. Uh, here we go. A high performing project team is on track to complete the product development within the remaining two iterations. Unfortunately, the project manager gets severely sick and won't be able to come back to work for the rest of the project duration. It is unclear how soon, if at all, the organization will be able to find a replacement. What should the team do? Should they A, take a self-study course on effective project management? Should they be self-organized to reduce user stories that may hinder project completion? Is it C, rotate the facilitator's role among the team members? Or is it D, postpone project work until a new project manager is assigned? So project team left alone, no project manager. Now, how are we moving forward? A, B, C, or D? I'll give you 20 seconds to input your answers. Oh, they're already coming in. Good, good.
at this point, it looks like we have a consensus from our folks here. Marjorie says C, Barry says C, Chris does C, Ishmael has a C, Satish has a C, Ahmed has a C, uh, Manohar, Samir, Ruxana, Mike, all of you have a C and all of you are correct. It is indeed C that is the correct answer. When the project leader is assigned to the project or, or missing, as is the case in this scenario here, high performing teams, especially those that work in agile environments, which is implied by this question here, they should be able to share the facilitator role among themselves. In fact, if you are leading this project and you are a good project manager, you make sure that this happens, right? And you will start stepping back very soon and say, I'm no longer the facilitator here. Why don't you take a facilitator role today and tomorrow you and you start rotating this, making people take responsibility right there and then, right? So yeah, the role can be shifted from one team member to the other. And by the way, um, nobody selected B here. And in our exam simulator, uh, in our exam simulator, about 25% of our students they do select B there, self-organize to reduce the user stories that may hinder completion. Now, if you were wondering between B and C, here's why B is incorrect. Right? At this point, according to the scenario the team is already self-organizing, right? And the team decides the, how they want to do the work. The team does not self-organize to decide which user stories they will be working on. Deciding which user stories are prioritized higher or lower, that is the job of the product owner. And B sort of implies, says, well, the team now does product owner work, right? That is not the case. Self-organization means we decide how we implement the work that the product owner has chosen as the next highest priority. Self-organizing doesn't mean, well, we just ignore the product owner and we take whatever we want from the backlog. That's why answer B there is incorrect and answer C is correct. I do have another exam tip for you uh, from the team domain. Previous students tell us that there are often role-related questions on the test. And uh, having a good simulator that includes plenty of test questions to check your understanding of roles, including Scrum Master, Project Managers, uh, that will help you before the exam day. So do expect two to three questions where the team role plays a role and you need to know this, right? And you've just seen this, right? The previous question sort of implied you had to understand in order to determine that B is wrong, you had to know that it's the the, the product owner's job to manage the backlog and not the team's job. They are not supposed to do that, right? And you won't know that unless you have a solid understanding there of the various roles. So those four, those are the definite roles that you must know in order to master the team domain for your PMP exam. We are moving on to the next domain here. Um, development approach and life cycle is what it's fully called. It's just not enough room, so I shortened it to life cycle, where we build products and where we manage projects. And uh, yeah, unlike the, the stakeholder domain, the word managing there is actually correct. Again, it shouldn't be managing those affected. It should be engaging those affected. So development approach and life cycle. Contemporary current project management has moved from the traditional, it's agile or waterfall, it's either or, to, um, to more of a doing a lot more tailoring. And this is now where this whole performance domain here comes in, right? It's related to the development approach, the life cycle. And it, it, it's not saying that 
you need to do agile or you need to do waterfall because today you're just as likely to find businesses running hybrid projects, a project with phases and stages and, and as well as teams using predictive and adaptive approaches. So anything nowadays is possible and everything goes. I remember about 10 years ago when Agile started to come up, it was just, yeah, Agile is so much better. You have to do Agile. You can't do anything else. It was it was really that the war started until everybody started to agree and saying, you know what? It's not either or, it's and. We, we work hand in hand and we use what makes sense. Yeah. And um, the development approach that you choose, that influences, however, how both the activity is run as well as the cadence of delivery. To come back to what I have just said, right? And um, Auntie Lehman reminds us here that one size does not fit all. Project management should be situational. Each project warrants the type of development, overall approach, and life cycle that fits best. So, a successful life cycle will be the one where each project phase connects and delivers value from the beginning to the end. And also that's where tailoring comes in, right? Even though you choose a certain development approach, a, a certain life cycle, you will still tailor it to your project. Marcus Kopko says about this, Every project is, by definition, individual and different from other projects. And tailoring allows you to adapt and bring in new ideas and practices that perfectly fit the influencing factor of the project, the company culture, people, results, resources, politics. Yeah, you have to take all of this into consideration, all of these various factors, as you are tailoring. You have to understand your organization, your team. Does your team even have agile experience? Well, if they don't, then let's maybe do it hybrid and bring in initial agile approaches and help them learn with this project. Is this a, a suitable project to do that? So all of those considerations you have to uh, look at in order to make sure that you choose the right development approach and life cycle. And performance measurement for the life cycle tends to simply be a reflection on whether the right approach has been chosen for the deliverables. In the end, you know, say, did were we successful? And was the success partially at least due to whatever uh, cycles and approaches we have chosen? And how exactly do you know which development approach and life cycle is best for your project? Well, here is what Shiv Shinoi from pmexamsmartnotes.com says. As a project manager, it is important to assess delivery expectations from the client, market dynamics, the nature of work up front, uh, as these can influence which development approach you go for. Uh, this will also help you to make early project decisions for other domains in the uh, in the life of your project now if you're wondering uh, what exactly is the difference between the development approach and the life cycle uh, i've i've got two slides here for you now um if you really drill down these slides are are a bit high level don't give all the details but it was important for me to show development approach life cycle, what is the difference, right? So I've been rather rather stringent and just said, this is left, this is right, okay? It, 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 it's never as black and white as I'm showing it here, but for, to, in order to show what the difference is, this is, this is what, we're, what, what I came up with, okay? So development approach, um, according to PMI, a method used to create and evolve the product, service, or result during the project life cycle, such as predictive, iterative, incremental, adaptive, or hybrid method. So the development approach on the left is inside the project life cycle on the right, and the project life cycle, that is the series of phases that a project passes through from its start to completion. Let's look at that from a slightly different perspective. So on the development approach, we will put things like a waterfall development approach, an iterative, incremental, or an agile development approach, whereas the project life cycle could be more plan, do, check, act, initiate, plan, 
execute, close, or whatever project management lifecycle methodology you use in your company, right? Uh, could be something like that. Nah, rational unified process. Again, doesn't fit here. So let's let's not uh, muddy the waters here with that. And so on the left, the development approach focused on developing the the product, whereas on the right, the project lifecycle. Uh, I've given it away there a bit. That focuses on the project. Once again, we are coming to our next sample question from pmexamsimulator.com here. A new project will require extensive stakeholder involvement and is expected to produce this first deliverable as soon as one month after getting the green light to proceed. The deliverable is anticipated to have a high degree of innovation. The performing organization operates in an industry that has considerable regulatory oversight. What development approach should the project manager recommend for this project? Should the development approach be A, adaptive, B, predictive, C, hybrid, or D, innovative? A, B, C, or D? Looking forward to your answers here. All right, we are getting the first answers here. Uh, Samir goes with A. Uh, then we have C, 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 C. Yeah, we're getting a lot of Cs. Ishmael is a D. Achem is a, is a D. Satish C. Manohar is a C. All right, the correct answer is, in fact, C, hybrid. Uh, the combination of the project variables that are described in this particular scenario, you know, uh, significant stakeholder involvement, the need for early delivery, the high degree of innovation of the deliverables. And on the other hand, that considerable regulatory oversight is an indication for the project to use a hybrid development approach. And this is the big difference between the answers A and C. Because 24% of the users of our exam simulator, they answer A. So they say adaptive is correct. The big indicator that adaptive is not correct is the regulatory oversight. Yes, we have, uh, we have a lot of, of, of innovation. We have a quick turnaround and, and all of that. But due to the fact that you have a high regulatory oversight that requires you to do a lot of plan driven as well because all this this regulatory stuff needs to be built in to your project ahead of time so a hybrid approach in this particular case is better and the plan driven approach is uh, uh excuse me the adaptive approach is not the right way of doing it uh, in this particular case. And by the way, um, I have taken a quote here from the explanation that comes from this question. My colleague Stas Podoxin uh, wrote this. He says, a development approach refers to the means used to create and involve the product, service, or result during the project life cycle. So once again, this is kind of a high-level overview of what exactly is the difference between development approach and life cycle. And to be honest, when I originally opened up the Pinball Guide 7th edition and I saw, oh, yeah, uh, you know, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And still, it's like, what exactly is it? So I figured it is important to focus on that and make sure that we do mention this here as well. Yeah, uh, one more tip before we close out this uh, third domain out of the four here, uh, exam tip. 
here. There are several types of PMP exam questions that reflect different life cycles. So it's really important to understand those during the test. The students who pass tell us that you may have to work out the approach from the scenario in the question. And that is a lot easier, obviously, if you have studied this domain. There is also a list from Oliver Lehmann out there. Um, I believe he calls them trigger words or keywords, where he has like a table and he says, okay, if the word is this, then it's most likely agile. If the word is this, it probably hybrid. If a word in the question says this, then it's probably a plan driven. So these keywords, trigger words, they'll help you in identifying, are we talking about agile, hybrid, waterfall, plan driven? What is the topic of this particular exam sample question here? We're moving on to domain four, planning, where we design the path to project success. Planning is a giant topic, right? Whole books written about the subject, but at the very least, right, this domain helps you to focus on setting up for a successful outcome through a structured approach to working out what needs to be done. There really is no requirement for you to use one particular planning approach over the other. Uh, the PMP exam and I, everybody really pretty agnostic, right? You can choose whatever planning approach works best for you. Uh, there are lots of ways to organize your work activities from the very beginning of an idea through achieving the outcomes and celebrating a job well done at the end. Uh, some work requires a lot of planning. Uh, other initiatives can be planned in a morning. Sometimes plans change frequently. Sometimes the original plan just stands firm. You can use it throughout the whole project. Uh, planning is more than simply knowing the dates. It's also about knowing how the work is going to be done. And that might include maybe a project performance plan, which you can refer back to and compare yourself against. It's a way of ensuring that you're in track and you want to deliver some value. Our first expert here, his name is Cornelius Fichtner uh, from pmprepcast.com. And he says that the focus has shifted from using planning as a means of controlling project outcomes to planning as a means to deliver the most value. Let me let me try to explain this by, by going back a little bit in history. When I when I started out uh, in project management, planning was this huge upfront effort, right? Everything had to be written down in stone, and you had to think about every little thing that could go wrong. That worked, right? That worked okay, uh, especially for physical projects like building projects, or also uh, the early. IT software development project where you're on these mainframes, these, these, these huge applications that needed to be built, right? But once you got a change request in, then, you know, the head scratching started. And it's like, yeah, why do you need this, right? Couldn't you think of this sooner? Uh, or uh, we can't do this. It's way too late in the project, right? Those kind of, 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 of responses, they were just there. That led to friction. Right? And, and it became very clear very, very soon that we needed a different approach. That doesn't work. Right? We cannot have this discrepancy between customers needing different requirements and, and we project teams just going, I'm sorry, but it's just not possible for us to do this. Right? So a new way had to be found. Right? It, it led to frustration to failed projects. And now the world of project planning has fundamentally changed. Ongoing, iterative, rolling wave planning, that is indeed the norm. Uh, um, so some planning considerations, right? In, in contemporary projects, planning is no longer something that's only done as a big effort up front. Instead, we accept the project environment is in constant flux. Uh, we need to be prepared to plan and replan and replan on an ongoing basis uh, to account for evolving and maturing customer needs and maturing customer expectations. Right? When planning projects and preparing for your PMP exam, it's helpful to understand and consider these things here. 
that you see on the slide. More information and more knowledge usually will come to light over time. You'll need to adjust to this changed environment, to these changed understandings. The benefits of shorter planning cycles combined with short development and delivery cycles is that they allow you to get customer feedback faster, more often, sooner, earlier, understand what the customer really wants. Planning is a means to move the project forward in an ongoing way and not necessarily to control every single aspect of the project. That's just not possible, right? And planning does include every aspect of your project, like schedule, budget, quality, and resources, but it doesn't mean that you can keep a handle and control over every single aspect, right? And then as I was writing this originally for the article, uh, I closed with uh, the last statement I said, so most importantly, when it comes to planning, plan to communicate and communicate your plan. And I thought, oh, somebody else must have said this before me. I searched on the internet. It turns out this is an original quote by me. So I give you plan to communicate and communicate to plan by me, Cornelius Fichtner, PMP. Uh, I, I own it as long as somebody else doesn't find that, oh, no, no, Aristotle already said that, BC. Okay, so I hope that my research is correct and that this is, in fact, an original quote by me. Plan to communicate, communicate to plan. Some planning success questions here. Uh, when it comes to measuring the success of planning a project, there are different ways to evaluate project tasks from a high level perspective. These come to us here from Ryan Fife, and uh, he is the COO of Work Plus. And so consider this Did the team have a proper plan in place for this project? Did they know what to expect? Did they consider all the factors before even beginning? Was there an initial assessment of the success criteria before deciding on the start date? Or did we just set a start date and they go, yeah, we'll figure out what the success criteria are later. And was there an evaluation at the midpoint to determine if adjustments were needed or if course corrections were warranted? So if you think of these five questions before you even start planning your project. I think you're going to have a much better and more in-depth plan in particular for being able to go back later on and say, were we successful? Because oftentimes you may end up in a project and go, was this successful from, from our perspective? And by the way, we'll be talking about project success in part two of this lesson uh, when we go into Oh, I don't remember which domain it was, domain five to eight, uh, but we'll be talking about stakeholder success and how to measure that uh, during uh, five to eight there. But this here will set the baseline and help you to be better prepared and better understand what your success is actually going to be. We are moving on to the fourth and final sample question that comes to us from the exam simulator at pmexamsimulator.com. Here it is. A project backlog comprised of various user stories. A project backlog is comprised of various user stories. Some represent unique and risky features. Others cover routine work activities. How should the routine work user stories be planned? Should routine work user stories be planned A, prioritized at the top of each sprint backlog, B, deferred until the last responsible moment, decomposed until W into WBS work packages, or D, removed from the sprint and project backlogs. So how do you deal with routine work user stories? A, B, C, or D? Please type your answer into the chat on Facebook and YouTube. This must be a harder one because I'm not yet getting any answers coming in. Right. 
Give you a few more seconds here. Ah, we're getting there. Marjorie has gone out on a limb, and Marjorie said, B, and uh, I can tell you, Marjorie, you are, in fact, correct. B is correct. We have D, we have A, we have A. Um, B is, in fact, correct. Marjorie there uh, picked the right letter, right? Why is B correct? Well, the concept of last responsible moment, right, that refers to a planning approach in which the decision on when the items representing routine work should be completed is deferred until you know, the cost of further delay exceeds the benefits. I am right now in a project when we are noticing this uh, quite a bit. We're kind of closing out and we're finally getting to these routine things that uh, nobody bothered doing earlier, but it was okay because these are things like uh, we're, we're building a new shopping cart uploading the images into our product catalog, going through the product catalog and doing SEO activities. We didn't need to do these early on. Who cares about SEO uh, when, you know, it, it's not even working technically at the moment. So these routine activities that need to be done on a project before you can launch, those routine activities, you defer those until the last moment, almost the, 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 the second before launch, right? You have to do it before launch. If we did it after launch, then SEO of our website would be bad. So that would not be a good thing. So you defer until the last responsible moment. That's the idea here. This is a lean development principle, by the way, a last responsible moment. And it's defined as a strategy of not making a premature decision, but instead delaying commitment and keeping important and irreversible decisions open until the cost of not making a decision becomes greater than the cost of making a decision. Right. So this is an important principle that we have to know for the PMP exam, doing something, planning something until the last responsible moment. And only then taking it up. So we've done four questions. I've mentioned I've mentioned the uh, prep cost training and the exam simulator a couple of times. Here you go, in case you don't know, pmprepcost.com for the training. And the PM prep cost exam simulator is at PM exam simulator.com. We are done. Thank you so much for joining me. As promised, a quick take action and then also some takeaways. The take action is pretty similar to the take actions that I've given you for the 12 principles from the Pinbox Guide. So if you are a PMI member, you can download the Pinbox Guide 7th edition uh, PDF from the PMI website. Simply go to pmprepcast.com slash pinbockdl, pinbock down load and it will take you to the page where you can download it. You have to be a PMI member and in order to do that, that's just a forwarding URL by the way, uh, so that when PMI changes their page, uh, you can still find it. We'll just update the forwarding link there. What I want you to do is um, with the 12 principles, I said, why don't you read each of those 12 principles? Because they're short, three pages, easily done in 10 minutes. Uh, the domains, they're longer. If you are struck for time, if you're, if you're short on time, then at the minimum, I want you to look at each of these four domains. Uh, at the beginning, there's usually sort of a box, an overview, uh, 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 an overview box that explains what this principle is all about. Then there are definitions followed by that box, usually sort of a salmon colored box with the definitions, I want you to study those definitions, and I want you to at least read the opening statements. Usually for each domain, three six to six paragraphs, something like that. Sometimes there's even a graphic there. And uh, I want you to read those opening paragraphs to get a feel for the domain. If you are short on time, that's what you should be doing. If you have all the time in the world, obviously you want to read the complete domain one, two, three, and four from the PMBOK guide. Takeaways, uh, just a quick one. So I've been talking about these domains and principles and they're both within the PMBOK guide. Let's just quickly review what they are as the big takeaway here. 
domains, those are select areas where we project managers apply our knowledge, our experience, and the principles from the standard. They guide us as we work our way through the domains. And the principles, again, second bullet point, they illustrate good project management behavior. So the principles is the behavior and the domains are the areas that we need to focus on as project managers and the principles help us do the right things in these, uh, in these domains. That's it for this lesson here of the project management prep cost with domains one, two, three, and four. I will see you again when we talk about the principles five to eight. Thank you for being here. Until next time. But before you go, this lesson is part of a series in which I help you to be better prepared for your PMP exam. Please do visit pm-prepcast.com slash more to watch all of them.